Hi again. We're on page 15 of 30 Years of Watchtower Slave and getting involved with the Watchtower. This section is, in, is the last section was about his war exploits and the dangers his family was continually in. And now Schnell tells the story of getting involved with the Watchtower. Grateful to the Lord that we were all alive and that we could once again live together in peace, my father and I resolved that henceforth we would spend all of our lives serving God in one way or another. Lost in this huge city of Berlin, we were one day visited by a Bible student who left with us some books which we began to read. Not long thereafter, we looked up the Bible students and began to associate with them. We had no other affiliations, and in the Berlin Bible Student Ecclesia, we found a good, goodly measure of brotherly love and happiness in fellowshipping. I was then about 16 years old and began to grow in spiritual matters. Let me say here that these Bible students, or Bible student ecclesias, or ecclesias, then were a far cry from the present meeting places of Jehovah's Witnesses, known as Kingdom Halls. Entirely independent from a central control, they selected their own elders from the, the spiritually mature within their midst, in accordance with Paul's instructions to Titus and Timothy. We observed that these people were consecrated Christians. They were rugged individualists, greatly concerned with making their calling and election sure, and in being transformed into the likeness of the Lord in their thinking, their living, and their behavior as well as their works in their daily lives. When they gathered in their meetings on Sunday for a Bible discourse and Wednesday night for a prayer and experience meeting, they came to be edified and to contribute towards such edification themselves. The meetings were true feasts of fellowshipping and Christian love. They were highly instructive, never authoritarian and arbitrary, as are now the meetings held in Kingdom Halls of Jehovah's Witnesses. Those who came to those meetings were not only concerned with each other's spiritual welfare, but arrangements were made for visits to the sick and the needy, and funds were provided by the ecclesia to lend help when needed. These meetings were filling a void in the life of my father and myself. They were a spiritual blessing to us. Let me repeat, this was a far cry from the present setup of a kingdom hall, where a servant comes to visit a kingdom publisher or Jehovah's Witness only if he fails to report service for a month or has not appeared at a meeting. The purpose of such visits today is only disciplinary, but it was not like that then. I can assure you that those were truly Christian visits in the sense that the Bible teaches charity. Works of charity occupied a considerable time of the Bible student groups. Not only did they help the needy of the congregation, but often outsiders, wherever such were found. We would bring such unfortunates in and feed and clothe them. After we had taken care of their physical needs, we would minister unto them more valuable things of the Spirit. Many were in this way salvaged from despair and brought into the communion of Christianity. Next of it is, I become active. The Bible students spent much time telling other people about their faith, about God's purposes, and about the salvation to be had in Jesus Christ. Of course, growing up in such an environment, I soon began to practice preaching of this sort. Between 1921 and 1924, I was able to continue my schooling and getting some ad academic education. Every afternoon, I would spend two hours, from three to five, going from house to house to tell people about God's purpose. I felt, as did those of my brethren, that the let me do that again. I felt, as did those of my brethren, that the prevailing uncertainty amongst the people everywhere called for special measures, special preaching efforts, in order to bring them nigh to real hope and salvation. That was the original motive of the practice of going from house to house. By the Lord's grace, though very young, I became highly successful. On one occasion, which even now stands out in my mind after all these years, I met with a lady who said she was possessed of demons. There was much of that during that period of time in Germany. She began to tell me of her plight and of the tortures to which she was being subjected. Seated as I was, looking at this lady whose face was of a white pallor, 
and whose hair was combed close to her head with eyes deep in their sockets. I became so scared I was unable to rise from my chair. Finally, when I realized she wanted me to say something, since I could not rise from the chair, I simply sank from it upon my knees, and she followed suit. For a full half hour I prayed, instinctively pouring out the woman's trouble before the Lord and asking the Lord to help her. When we finally arose from our knees, she asked me to come back. Later, after many visits, she became a Bible student. Still later, she told me that her trouble began disappearing while we were in prayer during that remarkable half hour on our knees. Being completely at a loss how to cope with such a situation, and being only a mere child of 17, I threw myself upon the Lord and put myself into his hands, and he did not let either of us down. That experience was a token of the mighty strength and power which God is willing to pour into man for his service. I will never forget what I learned that day. Had I not gone out and brought the good news of salvation, as every Christian should, trying to help people in distress, I would certainly have been the loser. During those three years, while going to school and working in Berlin as a schoolboy, I was used of God to help 17 people become Christians, three of whom had been atheists, one an anarchist, one a communist. Berlin was full of these godless groups right after the war. This was all done, as was the entire preaching work of the Berlin Ecclesia in those years, by inner compulsion, or inner impulsion, he puts it, not by organization compulsion, as now practiced by the theocratic-minded Jehovah's Witnesses. It was done in spirit. Paul says in Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart one believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This truth was demonstrated by these Berlin Christians. I had so very much to be thankful for, and I realized that I must do with all my God-given might what my hands found to do, and what my zeal made me capable of doing. Many others felt the same way. There were, of course, many who did not feel that way. However, such were not importuned to go and preach if they did not want to do so. They were allowed to fellowship with us, and we continued to help them to see more of God's purposes. I noticed that eventually many, of their own accord, would step in when the occasion presented itself to them, and would acquit themselves as men in Christ. When that happened, great was our rejoicing, for it was evident that this had been wrought by the Lord, and not by the use of psychological force of a society, or some company servant, as the overseers were called in that, those days. In November 1921, since I had not yet been water baptized, I gladly fulfilled that scriptural injunction and requirement. It appeared to me that spiritual things began to come easier and clearer to my ken from that day on. It seemed as if the heavens were opening up to my consecrated mind and heart. It pays to be obedient to all things commanded by Jesus Christ, and I soon realized that I had become a bona fide new creation. Let no one misinterpret this chapter as an evaluation or approval of the doctrinal tenets of the Bible students. I am only trying to explain when it was that what what it was that drew me to them. This is necessary to describe how and why I became involved in and finally enslaved to one of the world's most dictatorial and autocratic systems. Next time, Early Machinations, Chapter 2. Put in a link to uh, William Stevenson's book, uh, William Charles Stevenson's book, and uh, at the end of it, in drawing his conclusions, this ex-circuit servant, as, as, it, as it, they were called in the 1950s and 60s, this ex-circuit servant makes the point that is made here in the very last line of Schnell's analysis, namely that the Watchtower is implicitly totalitarian. See you next time.